Hello, my name is Sailaja Koduri. I'm a program officer at NHMS. Uh, welcome to NHMS CSI Mira webinar. Um, we have um, NHMS uh, staff uh, participating in the webinar, and I request them to introduce themselves. Um, Dr. Lars. Hi, this is John Lars. I'm the director of NIGMS. Dr. Greenberg. I'm Judith Greenberg, deputy director. Um, uh, Ms. Lisa Muller. Hi, I'm Lisa Muller. I'm a team leader in the grants administration branch. I'm Dr. Maksudwani. Hi, I'm Maksudwani. I'm chief of uh, cell biology integrated review group at Center for Scientific Review. And Matt Favilla. I'm with the service desk. I'm helping support the meeting. David. Yes, David Morkowski, service desk as well, supporting the meeting. Thank you. Um, so before uh, before we start the webinar, I just want to give some housekeeping items just to remind. Uh, please turn off uh, your audio um, when we are presenting. Um, that way, uh, we'll have enough bandwidth to run the webinar um, without any interruptions. Um, please post your questions in the chat box to everyone. That way, um, everyone get to see them, and we'll address them at, after the webinar. Um, uh, please note that this webinar will be posted. Um, the slides will be posted. It will be recorded and posted um, uh, on the website. Matt, we are recording, right? Yes, we are. OK, thank you. Um, next slide, please. So this webinar and accompanying slides are for informational purposes only. They serve as an overview of the ESI MIRA program and are not meant to be comprehensive in coverage of all required components of the applica an application. Um, please remember FOA is, um, has a lot of information and SF424 R&R &R guide, guide has a lot of information. So it's not possible to cover all the contents. So we are just giving an overview here so I strongly um, encourage you to uh, go through the FOA and the SF 424 instructions and any other um, guide notices, um, especially when you're in ESI. Uh, making yourself familiar with the process with NIH application submission is very beneficial. So I strongly suggest you to go through them um, multiple times um, that way to make sure you got the, understood the, understand the process well. Um, the current FOA, um, Link is uh, PAR-20-117. Um, this is the FOA you will be submitting your application. Um, next slide, please. Um, NHMS ESI MIRA uh, program is intended to provide support for research within the NHMS mission in the laboratory of an early stage investigator. NHMS supports research on basic biological processes as well as translational clinical research in certain areas. Um, also, within the scope of the MIRA, uh, investigators will have the freedom to explore new avenues of inquiry that arise during the course of their research as long as they remain within the mission of NHMS. So just to um, mention, unlike R01, where you have specific aims and you're bound by specific aims, you need permission to uh, from NIH before you even start a new experiment. Um, Mira gives you more flexibility in that way. Um, if you, during Mira award, you can go any research direction you want um, without uh, needing permission from NIH, and uh, as long as it is within the scope of the NIGMS Mira, NIGMS mission. Um, the only topics that need permission from NIGMS, uh, if you plan to go in that direction if they're not included in the original application are human subjects, clinical trials, vertebrate animals, stem cells, select agents, and a new for are, are a new foreign component. These require um, NHMS prior approval because they, uh, they have um, specific policies and guidelines. So if you in that broad scope of change, if you are introducing these topics, you do need NHMS prior approval. Next slide, please. Um, what are the goals of NIGMS CSI MIRA program? It's to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of its support for basic biomedical research and to enable investigators to apply earlier in their independent research careers 
So as soon as you get an independent position, you could apply for ESI Mira. <clears throat> Uh, to enhance investigators ability to move into research areas that are distinct from that of their postdoctoral mentors. So you're not bound by your postdoctoral work. If you want to go in a new direction and it's in the NIH and this mission, you are free to apply. We don't require preliminary data is neither expected nor required. Um, to increase the stability of investigator funding, MIRA funding is 250,000 per year for five years. So um, for a ESI, it's a good, it gives a very good stability and flexibility uh, to in doing the research. Um, so it also gives the flexibility, as I mentioned before, unlike R01, you have, um, you have more flexibility to go towards new directions. And to improve the distribution of funds to improve overall um, uh, scientific productivity and the chances for important breakthroughs. So this gives you time and uh, resources to, um, to go through the new discoveries. We expect you to go for new discoveries. Uh, reduce the time spent by researchers writing and reviewing grant applications, and also to enable investigators to devote more time and energy to mentoring activities. We expect um, we uh, the mentoring activity is very important part of your research career of an investigator to train the future researchers. So we hope this gives you more flexibility uh, towards that activity also. Next slide, please. Um, who, what is the eligibility criteria for uh, MIRA um, FOA? You must be an NIH defined early stage investigator. NIH has a clear cut definition of ESI, uh, who must be within 10 years from completion of uh, a PhD degree or a medical degree uh, within 10 years of completing residency training. Um, you must not have received substantial NIH funding as the PI of an independent research award. Uh, R01 and R01 equivalent awards are considered substantial research awards. Once you get an R01 award, you lose your ESI status. So that's the definition of uh, NIH ESI. Um, for MIRA FOA, only single PD PI applications are um, no MPI applications. Foreign applications from foreign institutions are not eligible. Um, so NIH has a very good website for ESI. I strongly encourage you to visit this website um, where there's a lot of information on who is eligible, what are the um, criteria for extension. If you are in the like last year of 10, like you're almost in the end of your ESI status, my suggestion is to look at there. Um, there are some options for you to extend if it is applicable um, and it gives you uh, the process to how to apply for this extension and what are the reasons you're allowed to ask for extension. Um, so please visit this website. Uh, it's available. It's like a lot of information there. Um, next slide, please. Um, NIGMS supports basic research that increases understanding of biological process and lays the foundation for advances in disease diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. Um, please visit NIGMS website uh, for OUF divisions and program contacts. Um, NIGMS also supports research in certain clinical areas, anesthesiology, uh, clinical pharmacology, sepsis, injury, and critical illness. Mechanistic clinical trials that a single set are allowed. Um, so if you look at the NIGMS website, um, the, there is clear information on the research areas supported by NIGMS and the program staff who oversees those areas. So uh, it gives an idea um, what kind of research is supported by NIGMS. Um, work supported by, uh, I also want to mention, work supported by NIGMS Division for Research uh, capacity building, um, such as like uh, IDEA COBRA grants. Uh, these are research infrastructure grants. They may include some research areas that are not part of NIGMS mission because the goal of that division is to in, uh, build infrastructure and increase the capacity building. Um, so they may or may not be appropriate for NIGMS and NIGMS support using the MIRA grant mechanism. So um, uh, we um, please contact me or the NIGMS program staff uh, just to make sure before you submit or like before you, few weeks before your submission or you start preparing the application um, to make sure you the program you're planning to propose is appropriate for NIGMS. 
uh, because you don't want to go through the process of writing an application and then and then realize, oh, NIMS is not accepting because it's not in their mission. So it's really useful um, to contact one of us, either me or the program staff. Um, that way uh, we know for sure we can tell you it is appropriate based on what you're proposing. Next slide, please. Um, just to touch upon the award information, you can request up to 250,000 direct costs per year for five years, um, but no uh, annual inflational uh, increases, um, they are not allowed. NIGMS expects to fund approximately as many early, early stage investigators through uh, this grant mechanism as it has been doing the past few years. It's a it's an institutional priority. We are we prioritize this uh, ESM era, and we are the biggest funders for, of ESIs. Um, foreign collaborations are allowed, but funding will be provided only when a consortium arrangement is essential to the um, research program. Uh, represents a it's a it it should have a it, there is a real need for it. It should be extremely well justified when you have a foreign collaboration and uh, that it can be supported by the collaborator. It, this situation is expected to be rare we, because again, it is a single PI PD application. We expect the PI to be the intellectual leader of the program they're proposing. Next slide, please. Okay, application submission information. Um, the research strategy is up to, uh, up to, six, it's up to six pages. Um, background in the areas of research and key gaps in understanding of are important challenges to be addressed. It should be included in these six pages. Any recent progress by the PI focusing on the past five years to give context um, for the overview of future research. Um, cite papers in bibliography um, if you don't have a lot of uh, preliminary data uh, or like to support the research you're proposing. Also, this 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 is like uh, this FOA made it very clear this time. Preliminary data is neither preliminary data are neither required nor expected. Um, so feasibility of the program. If you don't have preliminary data because you're applying as early as possible, as soon as you get an independent position, so you can use um, the feasibility of the program. May be demonstrated through literature citation data from other sources, are data generated by the applicant as a grad student or a postdoc fellow. Um, so application should include a letter of support from dean or chair. Um, next one is appendix. So please note that appendix has its own policy. Um, there was a uh, like a notice like a few years ago, eliminated most of the materials that were allowed before as part of the appendix. So if you include something which is not allowed, um, application will be rejected. So please make sure you look at the guidance before you uh, consider including some material under appendix. Um, so non-compliant applications will be written without review. As I mentioned uh, in the before, uh, read the FOA, read SF-424, because there's a lot of um, material, like you, know, you upload them as sections as a, to become an application package. If you do, if there are some guide, specific guidelines for some material, if you don't follow that information, um, the application will become non-compliant and it won't come for review. So please pay attention when you prepare the application and follow all the guidelines. Um, also, ESI um, MIRA mechanism give you an option, uh, more flexibility that you can apply for both ARBA1 and uh, MIRA at um, uh, uh, same time. Like you can submit an ARBA1 and R35, that's the activity code. Um, these two applications at the same time on the same topics um, um, for consideration at the same time. Uh, but if they both score well, we we'll fund only one. Um, this is to save time, you're on ESI, so it gives you, um, it takes time to review and decide, so this saves you time. Next slide, please. So I just want to, um, Little expand a little bit on the letter from the dean or trade person, uh, why it's important. Um, because it, this is a review panel is looking at what kind of support the PI is getting when, when he's starting his career. And so having this letter is really helpful for the reviewers to get an idea how well you are supported by your institution. 
So it should describe the institutional commitment to development of the investigator, including a mentoring plan for the for the PDPI, that's you. And it could also include information on startup packages, other support, space available, any salary support, any other commitment. And if you're not tenure track, how they can help you uh, uh, like in the future uh, to get to become tenure track. All of this information can be part of the support letter from your uh, from your uh, dean or chairperson. Um, so it's it it will be your favorable in the review. Uh, letters from former mentors are not required, nor encouraged, um, except in the case of continuing collaborations. Uh, remember, this is your project, and you are the intellectual driver of the program. Um, so you just want to show that you are independent. You're not still tied to your postdoc lab unless there is a real reason for collaboration. Um, so you want to make sure that comes off clearly. Um, so so it's not that's why it's not required, not encouraged. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this um, I'll give it over to my colleague Lisa Moller uh, to explain the application budget information. Lisa. Hi everyone, we wanted to, to include information about budget information because the instructions for your budget pages on your ESI Mira are very different than any NIH uh, budget pages that you have submitted previously, including previous renditions of the Mira applications. So it is absolutely imperative that you read the detailed instructions that we include in section four of the FOA and follow those instructions carefully. Because if you um, submit uh, too much information or too little, your application may not be accepted for review. So the first thing that is important to know is that because it's an R35 application, you have to submit the R&R um, the, um, R &R detailed budget form, even though you're only requesting up to $250,000 in direct cost. Uh, normally, you would submit a modular budget if this was an R01, but because it's an R35 mechanism, we are required to use that detailed budget form. However, as I just mentioned, we do have specific instructions on how you're going to fill out that detailed budget form. I did not include those specific uh, instructions in this slide because it would be, uh, become a little bit messy, but I'm just going to uh, refer to them in general. So you will use the detailed uh, budget form and um, you're only going to be completing uh, um, the uh, two sections, the section F, which is the total requested direct cost. And you're just going to enter the total direct costs that you're requesting for each budget year, and that's up to 250. Our expectation is that you're going to request the same amount in year one as you request in the out years. You're not going to build in any escalation. If you are um, requesting equipment, you'll uh, insert that under section um, or uh, box C, and then you won't add it in again uh, in the box F because it will roll into the total direct cost. Again, there are very specific instructions in the FOA. Um, under salary, you will not uh, indicate uh, uh, each uh, individual salary and what you're requesting. You're only putting in the total direct cost in section F, unless you're also asking for equipment. So under your budget justification, the instructions are very different for this section as well. You are only going to include the uh, information that's requested in the FOA, and I've included in this slide as well. So if you are requesting equipment, you'll include it a justification for the equipment, and you can also submit a quote here. In those very rare instances where you're asking for consortium costs, you will list um, the 
individuals and organizations with whom the consortium arrangements are made. You'll indicate whether it's foreign or domestic, and you'll list the consortium costs for each budget period broken down into direct cost and F&A. And finally, uh, if you have any F&A base exclusions, for, for example, if you uh, are requesting equipment or tuition, then you'll explain them in this section. Outside of those three things, you will include no other information. If none of these three things applies to your grant, just state not applicable on the budget justification page. That way you won't get a warning or an error, but we know that none of those things applies to you. So it's a very simple, uh, streamlined um, budget page, but it's very different than any other mechanism that you have completed. So it's imperative that you read those FOA budget instructions very carefully. I'm going to turn it back over to Maxoon for the next slide. Okay, hi, uh, this is Maxoon Vani again. I uh, coordinate the peer review of all the MIRA applications and Center for Scientific Review. And in the next four slides, I want to give you an overview of what happens to your application after you submit it and it goes through the peer review process until you finally receive the outcome of your application. So, uh, as um, Salaja in the beginning said, this FOA, the, uh, the submission deadline for this FOA is October 3rd, 2020. For the ESI MIRA application, there is only one single deadline per year. So, you must uh, consider this uh, deadline um, uh, carefully because next deadline will be uh, next year. Um, and, uh, you should also make sure that when you submit your application, you remember to use the correct FOA for this. The FOA number is FOA-20-117. This is specific FOA for the ESM era applications. You should also know that the application from the institutions is not submitted by you. It is submitted by your authorized individual at your sponsored programs. So you should work much in advance with your sponsored program to make sure that you are assembling your application in a correct uh, format and you are some, uh, putting it together uh, correctly. Uh, I want to also um, emphasize here <clears throat> that there are no late applications that will be accepted for this application for this FOA. The deadline for this is October 3rd, and that is when you must submit the application. So for that, I want to also um, tell you that you should not wait until the last minute to submit your application on the last day of the deadline. Maybe you should work with your AOR at your institution to submit your application maybe one or two days before the actual deadline. That is important because then you will have a couple of days to view your application if it was correctly submitted, if it was correctly assembled, and if there were any mistakes that you did during the submission, you still have a couple of days to fix those mistakes and resubmit them. So if after October 3rd, you find that there was any mistake in the application, you want to correct it, that won't happen. Your application may get, in that case, withdrawn, or it may proceed as for the peer review as an incorrect uh, application. So you should take that into consideration to just not wait until the last day and maybe submit your application a couple of days before uh, the <laughs> deadline. Maxis? Yes. It's John. Um, there's a couple of questions. The FOA says the due date is October 2nd for 2020. October 2nd, uh, I think if the if the deadline uh, falls on a weekend, weekend it okay. is the 3rd is the Saturday. So 3rd is the Saturday. Is Friday. If the 3rd is the Saturday, and uh, yeah, the actual deadline on the slide, it says 3rd, but the actual deadline is uh, basically indicated in the FOA itself. Okay, that have, says the 2nd. I can I can just uh, confirm it. Um, what is in the actual FOA? You should go by what is listed as a deadline in the FOA. Uh, so maybe ignore that in this what is in the slide here. So I'm trying to look for the actual deadline in the FOA. And it's it, October second in the FOA. It is October second for the 2020 and October four for 2021. So um, if the October second is the Friday. 
then that is the deadline. So sorry for the typo here in the slide as October 3rd. Uh, so uh, once again, submitted by October 2nd, uh, or just submitted a couple of days before. Uh, once the application is submitted, remember also the application is submitted through grants.gov, and uh, from the grants.gov, NIH retrieves its application using ERA Commons a system. So you should be uh, make sure making sure that you have an ERA Commons account and your credentials are you know correct. We use the ERA Commons validation to retrieve the application for the to belong to NIH from grants.gov. Um, so once the application is received at NIH, the Center for Scientific Review through its Division of Receipt and Referral receives all the applications and reviews them for its completeness and uh, the compliance and everything else. So uh, once the Division of Receipt and Referral makes sure the applications are in compliance, that's only when they just proceed uh, to the next step. Uh, eligibility for this FOA is defined by the ESA status of the PI in the NIH record system. Uh, so you as a PI should make sure that in your in the NIH system, your status is correct as an ESI. Because last time, many of the applica applicants whose applications were either sent back or they were asked to correct it because their ESA status was not defined correctly in the system. So you have a, there's a form there in your ERA Commons profile where you had to indicate the last day of your graduation when you graduated. So based on that, the NI system automatically calculates every year whether a person is falls under the ASA eligibility status. So you should make sure that you have that complete that profile correctly so that the system shows you as an eligible ESI. And any applications that are not ESA eligible will be basically withdrawn. Uh, you should also, like uh, Salaja said, that the responsiveness to the FOA is important. If any application that's not responsive to the FOA and does not fall under the mission, scientific mission of the NIGMS, those applications will be also withdrawn. So maybe before the app, you just put the application together, you may contact the NIGMS program contacts that are listed on the FOA to just make sure that the application you're preparing falls under the NIGMS mission before you just spend a lot of time on it. Uh, so next slide, please. So once the uh, Division of Receipt and Referrals at NIH uh, Center for Science Review retrieves all the applications, they are um, assigned to the Integrative Review Group in the CSR. And within the integrated review group, then the applications are looked for the scientific content and uh, uh, how these will be assembled in the specific special emphasis panels. All these MIRA applications currently are being reviewed in special emphasis panels. And each panel uh, for the ESA program reviews only ESIs. They are compared only to each other and not to the established investigators. So in these panels, the only application that will be reviewed are, from, are those which are from ESI investigators. So uh, you will not be compared to any other established investigators when they are reviewed in these panels. And each of these panels is managed by a specific scientific review officer who is responsible for uh, looking at the applications and what kind of expertise is needed for reviewing these applications. And they recruit the expert reviewers accordingly. And then each application in this study section in the special emphasis panel is basically assigned to three reviewers to review your application. And uh, the reviewers are given five to six weeks before they actually meet, discuss the applications. Before the actual review meeting, they have five to six weeks to review applications. They submit the preliminary scores and the critiques before the, all the reviewers that meet together to discuss the most meritorious application. So for this FOA, reviewers use modified review criteria, which is specific to the FOA that is listed in the FOA uh, um, that you may have already looked at, which is publicly available. And in addition to the specific review criteria, there are standard review criteria that the reviewers use. And they take into account the importance of the questions that are being asked in the application, the past productivity of the uh, applicant, and the applicant's future potential 
and whether the environment uh, where the PI is is very conducive to the success of the investigator, and the reviewers will not look at the details of the approach in the application. Remember, these applications are only six pages long, so you do not have to just put details uh, in the uh, in the approach uh, section, but you must uh, put your application together in a manner within those six pages that you are conveying the important points to the reviewers. And the reviewers uh, will use only one single score, which is the overall impact score, that they will base on the review criteria. There won't be any criteria scores uh, given for these applications as they are given to the R01 and other mechanism applications. Only one overall impact score is given. And depending on the number of the applications, we generally uh, review uh, two thirds. We, we generally discuss at the study section two thirds of the total number of applications or one half of the applications. So there, there will be upper half of the applications, which may be either 50% of the total applications or maybe 70% of the total applications that will be discussed at the meeting. So, uh, so most meritorious applications get only get discussed at the meeting. Uh, next slide, please. So like I said, the reviewers uh, are asked to give the overall impact of a given application based on the five major review criteria, which are significance, investigator, innovation, approach, and environment. Uh, the significance of the application, they assess uh, by seeing if the research program is substantive in its scope and is adequately broad and efficient in nature. Uh, will the uh, proposal um, proposed research permit the PI to establish a uniquely independent place in the field? So you had to you had to convey to the reviewers that um, you will have a specific niche in the field. So investigator will be evaluated uh, by assessing uh, if they have appropriate training, previous training, if they have record of productivity, and uh, the the impact they have had in their past. Uh, in the in the field they are working on, and they have also shown the evidence of creativity and adaptive adaptability. As you uh, will be seeing that you, you over a period of five years you may adapt um, differently. So they have to assess the, whether the investigator will, will have that uh, nature of adaptability, and the potential to establish successful independent program of research, and will have a promise as a mentor. Uh, 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 in mentoring other people, other scientists, junior scientists, like postdocs and graduate students, and with the time, uh, other junior scientists. Uh, as for the innovation, they will assess if there is evidence that the creative strategies will be employed as needed and appropriate to address the research questions that you are posing in the application. Um, next, please. So next two criteria are the approach and the environment. Like I said earlier, in the approach, you do not have to provide the nitty gritty details, but they will see if there is sound basis for the proposed research and evidence that the research program will evolve appropriately as the work is performed. Like Slaja in the beginning said that they, you do not need to have preliminary results to establish, but the feasibility should be established by the prior research in the literature or your own work that you have done in the past as a graduate student or the postdoc, or you may be doing currently that you have preliminary that they can put, uh, but it, that, that's not needed. Uh, but there has to be a strong premise uh, for the application uh, that uh, is your approach is based on the, you know, um, uh, the, uh, your, uh, your foundation of the research is based on the um, published work in the literature uh, or your own uh, work that you may have done in the past or currently. Uh, the preliminary data, like I said, is uh, not included, is not necessary. However, if you do include the preliminary data, then that will be assessed. And uh, uh, the reviewers will see if the relevant concepts and methods are sufficiently established by the prior literature, like I said, and if there is a logical plan for sustained progress across a research program for the five-year uh, award period. For the environment, they would like to see, the reviewers would like to see if there's evidence that the PI has an independent research position. So you have to have an independent research position for this program, and the environment is conducive to the development of the PI. By that, I mean 
that you are in an environment where you have the institutional support and you have proper mentoring. There are other people who are just basically uh, mentoring you during the uh, during the program, and there is institutional support for your sustained uh, um, success uh, during this program. So these are the five review criteria they base their overall impact on. Like I said, the, each review criteria will not be given an individual criterion score. There will be only one overall impact score, but that overall impact score will be based on these five major review criteria. So you have to keep that in mind and. These is a, the, the, whatever I just said there is an abbreviated form, but if you look at the FOA, it is explained in detail there what the review criteria are, both the standard um, the review criteria as well as the criteria specific to this FOA. So when you write an application, you should keep that in mind, what are those criteria and how you convey uh, the points uh, in your application. So I want to also say that these are the five major review criteria. However, there are other criteria that we ask reviewers to look at. Some of them are scorable and some of them are non-scorable. To make you should make sure that your application is complete for those criteria also. For example, if you are using animal subjects, you have to address the you know protection uh, of the vertebrate animal welfare plan. If you are using human subjects, you have to address the protection to the human subjects. If you are using biohazards, you have to address that. In addition to non-scorable uh, criteria, you have to just make sure that you have addressed the uh, uh, authentication of the biological resources that you are using. So all that is explained in the FOA, if you read that FOA in detail, that will help you in putting your application together. So after the review, uh, uh, reviewers submit their critiques and the scores, we take the upper half, like I said, that could be 70 to 80% sometimes of the application that we'll discuss at the meeting, where all the reviewers assemble. Well, the three reviewers are the ones who review each application, but at the meeting after the application discussed, all the reviewers then provide their overall impact score, and it is the score of all the reviewers that is basically averaged together to give you an overall impact score. So the applications that are discussed, they receive an overall impact score and also a summary statement that includes the resume of the discussion, discussion of the reviewers that happened at the meeting. However, those applications which do not get discussed, they do not receive any overall impact score and they do not receive any resume of the discussion, but they receive a summary statement that includes the critiques of all the three reviewers who reviewed that application. So whether you are discussed, applicant or not discussed, you will receive a summary statement. Depending on whether it was discussed or not discussed, you may receive a score or you may not receive a score. So after the summary uh, meeting is done, the scores are released in the system within three business days after the meeting. So you should receive your score in the through ARA Commons. You can access your score and see if your application was discussed and how it was scored. And then after the meeting, within 30 days, you will receive the complete summary statement that you will access again through the ARA Commons. And after the meeting, um, uh, review meeting is done, your primary point of contact is going to be your program officer uh, who is listed on the face page of that summary statement. So if you have any questions you want to discuss your summary statement, you should contact the relevant program officer to discuss that application. And before the review meeting, your primary contact is going to be the scientific review officer who is assigned to the uh, this special emphasis panel, whatever application is discussed, whatever application is reviewed. So if you have any questions before the meeting happens, you should always contact the program uh, uh, scientific review officer to address any questions. If you see the review uh, the meeting roster, and if you don't find any person who may have expertise for your application, you should bring that question to the scientific review officer. Or you may find somebody, you may have a strong conflict, prior conflict, you should bring that to attention of the um, scientific group officer, because we take both things into um, you know, serious consideration, the conflicts as well as the expertise. We want to make sure that everybody is fairly reviewed and gets a fair objective review of the application. Uh, with that, I thank you and I just pass it on to again to Salaija. Um, I just want to give an overview like what happens once the applications are scored and um, what is the process so once the applications are scored, um, NAGMS will contact the um, applicants with the scores 
um, for a just-in-time information because um, this just-in-time information requires the PI must commit 51% of research effort to MIRA award. That's a requirement as for the FOA. So once the applications are scored, NHMS program staff contacts the PI to submit just-in-time just information, including a letter from their institution indicating that they will commit 51% of research effort to MIRA once, once it's awarded. Um, all other NHMS funding must be relinquished and pending applications withdrawn, except for the funding mechanisms allowed by the ESI MIRA FOA. Um, there are some exceptions. Those are not toward those are not towards research support. Only those are allowed. Uh, but all other all other support from NHMS uh, must be withdrawn before the MIRA award is made. Um, permanent change of PI is not permitted. Um, but temporary changes are allowed if your PI is not able for a short time. Uh, they can have somebody in charge, um, but permanent change is not allowed. Um, if you're leaving an institution, you got a new position somewhere else within U.S., you can take the grant with you, providing your institution um, agrees to transfer it with you. Um, but you cannot take it to your foreign institution. Um, changes in scope require prior approval, as I mentioned human subjects, vertebrate animals, all these topics which were not reviewed uh, when your application is submitted. If you're uh, adding them later on, they need prior approval. Um, also, NIH in general expects a research progress performance progress report annually. It's required. Um, so NHMS uh, MIRA RPPR should include additional uh, information mainly dealing with the changes like okay this is the project you came under and you are going in a new direction you need to provide that information what are the changes in the research direction and any information on training and professional development activities and other support your lab like you after a year after getting the mira you got new grants and we um, expect we, this information needs to be included it's part of uh, all our prs next slide please so the, I just want to um, just go through this this one quickly. Uh, there are very important website links are here. Uh, the first one is, of course, the MIRA FOA, the PAR-20-117. This is the current ESI MIRA FOA. And this is the FOA you will be submitting applications. Um, NHMS MIRA website, it's a very good uh, place to go to because it has the both MIRA mechanisms and also FAQs and all of the relevant information. So please make sure you go to this website to see the information. The next one, FAQs, we have extensive, we, uh, we addressed as much as possible all the questions you have um, under this FAQs. I strongly recommend you go through these FAQs. These are like more than 20 pages. Um, so please go through them before you come to us because you might find the answer and save time by looking at it. Um, the next one, I it's a feedback loop post. This site does your work fit in NHMS mission? As I'm telling you, contact us um, before you submit uh, to make sure your the program you're proposing is appropriate for NHMS mission. So we posted a feedback loop post last last year. Uh, recently, like giving some examples how um, NHMS staff looks at uh, projects and how we determine they're relevant to NHMS mission. There are very good specific examples in this feedback loop post. So please read it that way. You have you, you get an understanding how we look at the applications. Um, so the, the next two websites, NIH website to applicants and application form instructions. These are very good websites to go to especially the application form instructions it it's like a it's like a hand holding instructions it tells you how to fill the application and where to look for what kind of information you can include under each section this is very helpful and it's updated frequently as we update the forms so um, i strongly suggest you look at these uh, websites uh, the last one, this is um, uh, this is the latest feedback loop post uh, just came uh, same time as we announced in the webinar. Um, this shows you the MIRA ESI and EI MIRA funding trends, uh, in overall impact scores on the funding trends for the last few years. Um, so if you're thinking how your score, or if you get a score, how it fits in the mission, uh, not fits in the mission, how it will be funded, how it fits in the overall funding trend, 
this is the best um, feedback loop post to read because it gives you an overview. Again, please remember this mechanism has been in place almost for the last five years. We are um, compiling the data as we go to share as much as possible with you. Um, but this is the latest one, and you can uh, get all the information you're looking about uh, overall impact scores and funding trends here. Um, next slide, please. So here are the contacts. Um, yeah, if you have any program-related questions, uh, please ask me, send an email to me, or ask a NHMS program officer whom you think your research program uh, they oversees the same uh, area. Uh, if you have any review-related questions, uh, contact uh, Dr. Maksudwani. Of course, budget. Um, uh, when you're preparing your budget, if you have any questions regarding salary effort, time effort, uh, all those questions, uh, please contact Ms. Lisa Muller. Um, thank you for your, in your interest in the MIRA program. Uh, questions? So, Sarah, there are lots of questions. Do you want me to re start reading them, and um, then you all can, can handle them? All right, so uh, there was a question. If somebody is a faculty fellow, so they're not yet a tenure track faculty, but they're in an independent fellow position, are they eligible to apply? Um, I think the answer is yes, as long as their institution says they're uh, eligible to apply for NIH, uh, independent NIH grants, right? I think it is uh, uh, always applicant is the, always the institution. Right. So it is the institution who submits the application, and they have to make sure that the applicant uh, is independent. Right. Um, let's see. So um, number of questions about if you're a co-I on a R01, an IGMS R01, are you still eligible to apply? Yes. Co-Is are eligible. Uh, uh, you can check your ESI status in any area commons. Only the PI or MPI status disqualifies you. Co-I doesn't take off because it's not your award. You're just a co-investigator uh, and an R01 award. I think it's, a, I, I want to make clear, NIH doesn't use co-PI anymore. That's gone long ago. The terms are PI or MPI. Only those two will make you ineligible for ESI. Right. Um, so how broad does the research have to be? Um, does it have to be a central theme? Can there be multiple different lines of evidence or lines of research? Yeah, you, it doesn't, there, there's no need for a unifying theme. Um, you can have multiple projects on disparate topics. Uh, there's no, there's no obligation to have a unifying theme, uh, but you should directly address the rationale underlying the balance of effort and the resources dedicated to each activity and how these activities are distinct or complementary. So there is no need for a unifying theme. What's the level of risk that we expect for a MIRA? Is it like an R01 or can there be high risk, high reward components? I think uh, it's a, we expect a high risk, high reward because you have given more flexibility in any direction you go. We expect uh, discoveries and breakthroughs. Um, so um, I think it's it's really either. Um, you can it can be high risk, high reward. That's encouraged. Mm -hmm. um, but if you have you know standard but very important questions that you're asking um, that you might also see in R1, that's also okay too. So high risk, high reward, encouraged, fine. But other kinds of research also. Um, are are fine and encouraged. Uh, let's see. Um, there was one from Max Sood. Can you ask for a particular study section, Max Sood, to review your application? Uh, as of as of now, we do not have standing study sections. These applications are reviewed in uh, special emphasis panels, and these special emphasis panels are assembled each time. Uh, uh, de novo so you, you 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 cannot you you may suggest a study section from that it may give us an idea of what kind of a research you are doing but there are these are not reviewed in standard study sections we are in the process of making standing standing study sections for mira going forward it's in the process once when they are established they will be uh, put on the web and you will have an access to them and then at that time you may be able to suggest a particular study section 
right now there are no charter study sections for these applications. Okay, so there are a lot of questions about um, pa parallel submissions of grants. So you said that you can have an R01 into NIGMS at the same time as the ESI Mira. That's an exception that that's been granted. Somebody asked about whether you could have a U01, um, and somebody else asked if you could have an R21. Um, and then somebody else also asked, and I think this is a key point here, um, what about applications to other institutes? And the latter is you, you can have applications to other institutes as long as they don't overlap with the research you're proposing in the MIRA. Um, in fact, you can get an R01 from another institute after you get your ESI MIRA, although if you got it first, you would no longer be an ESI, so you wouldn't be able to get the MIRA. Uh, but what about the other questions, Silaja? At all. I think, I think the, the, the only exception we have at this time is R01 and R35 uh, can be submitted at the same time. There are no exception for R21 or U01. That's right. Um, and, and I also, we don't have very, really any U01s um, that you would be applying to. So I think that's probably not an issue. Right. Um, Let's see. Oh, if we are applying to early career awards from private foundations, can there be overlap between the research proposed? Um, so, i.e., could you have a MIRA and a private foundation grant that were about the same research? Um, Lisa, do you want to actually take that one? Yep. Um, I would say that there would be an overlap situation, if not right. with um, effort or the budget or the science. So yeah, we have to look at that on a case by case basis. Yeah, so that's probably gonna be a problem. Um, you wanna make sure your grants are as distinct as possible. You can't have a federal grant that's funding the same research as any other kind of grant. So bear that in mind. Um, let's see, this thing keeps jumping around on me. Um, Somebody asked, does this mechanism only support basic science research? Um, Sila, did you want to just address the mission of NIGMS for a second? Yeah, I just went through it. Uh, basically, it's basic biological processes. Um, uh, and also, we also support some translational clinical in certain areas, as I mentioned in my presentation. Yeah, uh, basic biological processes as a broad, like, uh, just to give an example, if you're looking at a cancer research or uh, heart, lung, there are specific NIH institutes who support that research even in their basic areas. So NHMS is more uh, broad, basic biological research, fundamental uh, research. Um, that's the reason I we keep telling, uh, please send the abstract which you plan to propose. That way we can take a look at it and tell you. And also you can look at our website for the research we support. Uh, let's see, there were a couple for Max Sood here as well. Um, if the grant is not discussed, will you still see an overall impact score? No, uh, if the grant is not discussed, there won't be any overall impact score because it was not discussed. The overall impact score is given at the study session meetings for the applications that are discussed, all the reviewers provide an oral impact score based on the discussion of the application. But those applications who, which do not get discussed, they do not receive that score, so there is no oral impact score. However, you will receive a summary statement that will include the critiques from all three reviewers, but no overall impact score for not discussed application. Right. Um, some questions about the letter from the uh, senior official at the institution. So that can be from a department chair, right, Silaja? That's correct, yes. Okay, and, and that, that's a separate part of the application than the six-page research plan, correct? Yes, yes. Separate. you upload the letters separately. There is a section for letters of support. Yeah, so that doesn't count against your six pages. No, it doesn't. Um, and then the mentoring piece of, of what's being reviewed, and this may be a question both for Silaja and Maxud, um, where should they put that in their application? Should they actually put it in the six pages? Should it be in the bio sketch? Um, some information to let reviewers know about their potential as mentors. 
that that uh, if i if i am the uh, uh, putting an application together i'll put all that information in the bias sketch and save the six page for the research strategy and uh, and to put as much as possible in the research strategy but the mentoring part the reviewers look at you don't have to actually uh, you know verbally write in the app, I, I i have that potential the reviewers have the ability to assess from the bias sketch if the person has that mentoring ability and you can put the application if you have mentored some graduate students and you have mentored some undergraduate students in the past or you are mentoring postdocs all that information is useful for the reviewers to assess whether this PI has that potential to mentor others. That's correct. So then there are a number of questions from people at primarily undergraduate institutions um, asking whether or not they should apply for the MIRA versus an R15 area grant. Um, any thinking on that, Silaja? So uh, it depends. You are encouraged to apply for a MIRA, um, but I think you can build from R15. Um, it, depending on what is the situation, how much support you have, um, uh, but you we we accept both mechanisms, and uh, we have seen people go from R15 to R35. But you are eligible to apply for R35, and if you think you have all the resources, please go ahead. So there's some questions here about so, for instance, for research with long-term application in cancer therapy or infectious disease vaccine. What level of animal application studies, therapy, or vaccine are allowed after basic research in R35? I guess the first thing I'd say there is if you are doing research on cancer therapy or infectious disease vaccine, it's very unlikely your work's in the mission of NIGMS. Um, those are the missions of NCI or NIAID. So again, as Sal just said, really make sure you talk to a program officer here at NIGMS before you write your application. Um, so you know that, uh, or you're, you're confident that it's going to be in the mission of the Institute, um, because if it's not, it will get returned to you without review. And, and that unfortunately does happen every year. Um, but that's really something to consider. Some questions about the percent, 51% uh, research effort. Uh, people want to know how that's calculated and, and what that means. Sila, did you want to just go through that quickly or, or I guess Lisa? Maybe. Hi, this is Lisa. I can answer that. So when we look at your other support page, we add up uh, all of your other support or effort over uh, your various grants, including your what you're proposing for your MIRA, and we add that together. And then we multiply that by 51%, and the effort you're dedicating to the MIRA has to equal at least 51% of that total effort listed. And, uh, and the 51% effort is the 51% of a research effort, not the total effort. Isn't right. that correct? Not, right, not your not your total professional effort. Yeah, not your professional. You can exclude the teaching uh, responsibilities. Correct. Somebody had that question. Teaching. And whatever research effort is, let's say your research effort at the institution is 50% of a total effort. So it is a 51% of that 50%. That's correct. Yeah. Exactly. That's right. Teaching, administration, and our clinical duties, they're not counted towards research effort. Can someone have a K award and a MIRA at the same time? Hi, it's Lisa again. So um, if your K award is with NIGMS, we will ask you to relinquish that prior to the start date of your MIRA. If your K award is with another NIHIC, we, um, uh, if you can, uh, you'll have to go back to them and ask if you can have um, less effort. But because the mirror requires 51% effort, that would mean your K award would need to be 49% or below. And most ICs will not allow that. So you'll have to be prepared to choose either your K or your MIRA. So another question about overlapping applications. Can we submit a DP2 and a MIRA grant during the same cycle? Um, I guess I can answer this. The Common Fund doesn't allow you to have the DP2 in. That's the same research as the MIRA. Um, so if they're very similar research, the answer is no. 
Uh, let's see. Uh, da, da, da. Sorry, I'm good. Things are jumping around here. Um, when contacting the PO to check the project relevance, uh, what's the preferred form? Should the, because there's no specific aims. Uh, should you send in the abstract? Should the the um, applicant just type up a brief description? Sila Joe, what would you like to see? I think you should send an abstract as closely as possible to the proposal, the program you're planning to submit, because um, again, you're sending as a, an abstract, like a half page abstract or a one page abstract. That's what I've seen, but it should closely resemble the application or program you plan to submit. Um, so if you send, I know I've seen people send three lines, four lines, it's very hard for us to assess what would be the application. So send uh, information closely as much as possible, resembling the program you plan to propose. That way we can give you a good um, idea how well it fits in our mission. So, um, Lisa, can you postpone the Mira award for the next budget cycle if you get a Mira while you have a K award? No, the Miras are awarded in the same. Uh, um, they they cannot be postponed to an, the next budget period. So you'll have to decide when you want to submit that um, Mira application if you're holding a K award. But I will say, if you do get a, a Miro award that scores well, your K award has done its job. It's led you into a um, position where you have an independent research award. Exactly. One, one of the things we're really wanting to see with the ESI Miro program is for people to get funded with, with the Mira as early as possible in their independent career. So. Um, you know, we would like you to apply as soon as you can as an independent investigator, and we would like to fund you as soon as we can with the MIRA. So that's one of the things we're trying to do. Um, questions about if you applied already for a MIRA and you weren't successful, um, what do you do when you come in again with a MIRA? And so I think some people are a little confused about whether you have a revision or revised application. Um, you know, what we often call resubmission. D does a letter go with that that describes changes you made? Maxud, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, yeah. So, so for the MIRA applications, we do not accept resubmissions. It is a new application every time. If you, let's say, were unsuccessful this year, you had to wait until next year, and you had to be next year again eligible ESI to apply for this uh, ESI MIRA. And it has to be a new application. It cannot be an A1 a resubmission of a previous application that was not successful because resubmissions are not allowed for MIRA applications. Right. So it has so to be personal every, every time. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so if you apply before, as Max had said, you can apply again, but it's a new application. There's you know, no, no, no reference to the previous reviews, no letter about uh, what you changed. And, and actually, I think your application will be withdrawn if you put those things in, right, Maxu? That's true. No reference to the previous application score or anything. It's a new application, and the submissions are not allowed for the MIRA, and there is no introduction to the new application. It has been new every time. Yeah. Um, so some people are asking what should be in the chair or dean's letter, for instance. Should there be information about startup packages, um, space provided, et cetera? Sailaja, what's yeah, your I thought? Just, I just went through that slide. Yes, all the support they can give you, space provider, professional development activities. If you're non tenure track, what is the plan to improve your career uh, prospects? Any information that's, uh, that shows strong support from a department or institution would help you in review. Including the mentorship plans for the new right. faculty. Right. Yeah, that's, that's very important. Um, if a MIRA, let's see, uh, is there a MIRA for the bioinformatics computational biology branch, specifically the mathematical biology section, since it says the submission needs to be to NSF? So, Judith, do you want to clear this one up? Yes. Um, the, the answer to the question is yes, if it's um, mathematical or computational and it's otherwise within NIGMS's mission, it's definitely um, eligible for MIRA. 
Yeah, and so the confusion there is we also separately have a math bio program that's jointly with the NSF. That's an, an R01 funding um, mechanism for that. Um, and that's a separate program. You, you can certainly apply for that as an ESI, um, but it's a different program. So you can also apply, as Judith said, to the MIRA um, if your research is otherwise within the mission of NIGMS. So how are funding decisions made after the review meeting? So maybe I can handle that. Um, so the scores come in, the reviews come in. There's a lot of discussion amongst the program staff, uh, you know, the leadership of the Institute. And then based on all the information we have, um, including the just-in-time information that you provide about your other support, um, funding recommendations are made, uh, and then eventually um, funding decisions are made and grants are funded. So it's really a holistic process. It's not only based on the score of your application. We look very carefully at what the reviewers said and what the summary statement says, um, the summary of the discussion, if there was one, um, and then make a basically a holistic funding decision. I would encourage you strongly to look at the feedback loop post that Silaja um, mentioned on the last slide, and these slides will be put up on the website so you can access them, um, that talked about funding trends for the MIRA program. That shows you how many applications we've been receiving, um, what the success rates are, um, and for ESI MIRAs, the success rates are are really quite high. Um, so, you know, I would encourage all of you to to apply to this program. I think it's really the way way to go. Let's see. Webinar was recorded, so you can watch it again when it's up. Fundable impact score. Again, go to the uh, feedback loop post that's there. Um, the funding trends for MIRA feedback loop post came out a couple of weeks ago. It will show you the distribution of scores versus what got funded. Uh, we don't use a strict pay line, so we can't say if you got this score, you will definitely be funded. There's there's often exceptions, um, you know, but um, scores certainly in the 40s uh, were, were still being funded. So uh, take a look at that post. What's the funding rate currently? I believe last year it was about 40% was the success rate. Um, let's see, other, we've got a lot of the questions answered. Uh, if your position did not include startup, will you still be competitive for a MIRA? That's an interesting question. Maxud and Silaja, what's your experience on that? I think I heard um, that letter should come. They're not looking for a startup package, but the review panel will be looking for a support system. Um, so as long as the letter strong, shows strong support, how the PI will be submitted, um, PI will be supported, I think the application would do well. I don't think they're paying attention to startup packages. That, that's what my um, experience, but Maksud, what do you think? No, <clears throat> the reviewers do not look at anything like that. They do not look whether somebody got a sub, uh, startup package or not. You, you, you may be in the second year of your, you know, faculty position, and you may have already exhausted your uh, startup money, even if you had it. They do, they're not looking at numbers, but they look at the institutional support and the chairperson's letter, how the institution is going to support this EI to become a very successful and long-term researcher with a sustained, impactful research program. That's what they're looking at, if, as far as institutional support is concerned. Not that the person has this much support, uh, this much institutional money and this and that. They don't know. Yeah. I think the key is, as Max had said, they want to see evidence that you are being supported by your institution. So that could be that they gave a startup package, but if you didn't get a startup package, they're going to want to show that in other ways, right? That they actually yeah. are supporting you somehow. Um, so if your application was not discussed last round, do you have to submit a completely different research program when you um, submit your, you know, you try to get a mirror for a second round? Um, Maxud? No, you don't have to. We do not look at the previous application, what it was like, whether it is same, but you you should you should look at your critiques and your critiques should tell you whether your research uh, uh, program is, you know, uh, why does it stand from the reverse critiques? whether you should change the direction, whether you substantially, you know, modify it, or you can send the same thing. We, we do not look uh, whether it is the same or not. So it is it is your own judgment 
whether you should submit same application once again based on the you know reviews that you get and the reviews you get they are very thorough and they are very objective reviews you should take them into consideration when you just prepare another application next year take that into account and make sure that you just you know improve your application before sending do not send the exact same application right um number of questions about if somebody is a um project leader um, for a Cobri um, pilot project, for example. So this is an idea state um, grant mechanism. Um, can you apply for a MIRA? So the answer to that is, if your research is in the mission of NIGMS and you are an early stage investigator, yes, you can apply uh, for a MIRA and you're, you're very much encouraged to do so. Um, let's see. Um, so Maxine, what are the main criteria for scoring approach that reviewers use that's different than R01 in your experience? Uh, they, like I said, it, they do not look at the very nitty gritty details. They look at the feasibility. They look at the approach are sound and they are doable. And uh, you know, uh, based on also the uh, investigators track record they they see that whether you know they can be just um, uh, they can be completed so uh, i don't think they look at the approach um, uh, the way they look at the r01 uh, particularly this only six page application and um, they they look at the sound approach are taken um, which are going to work um, and the investigator has to kind of just convey it how it's going to work uh, without any without any details Great. So here's a very important question. So does NIH have ev evidence of equity in awarding MIRA to male and female applicants and those from diverse backgrounds based on the applicant pool? If much of the evaluation is based on perceived potential of young investigator applicants, implicit biases could affect reviewer decisions more for MIRA than for grants that are based on specific project data. That was definitely something we have been worried about and we've been very carefully monitoring um, the demographics of both the applicant pool and the award um, pool in, in MIRA. And actually, there's a feedback loop post of data from the last few years um, that I will try to post in the box here. Um, the, the data for, for the ESI MIRA program is actually quite good uh, between male and female um, and between underrep underrepresented groups in general. Um, and well-represented groups. For the established investigator program, uh, it's still, there. there's uh, between underrepresented um, racial ethnic groups and well-represented groups, there's still some disparity. Although men and women um, are, are doing on par with each other. Um, and I'll try to put that into the, the box in just a second, but that's an excellent question and something we're monitoring very closely. The other thing we're doing for the MIRA program or piloting in the MIRA program in partnership with the Center for Scientific Review and the Chief Officer for Scientific Workforce Diversity is um, bias training for not just reviewers, but SROs um, and program officers as well in, in terms of the funding recommendations. So, so that pilot program is starting um, again to try to um, make sure that, that these kinds of things don't creep into the system. So that, that's an excellent question. Um, Max Sood, will disruption caused by COVID-19 shutdowns of labs and facilities uh, be considered first in review? Um, and then also, I guess we can address this in terms of ESI status extension. Uh, the latter, definitely yes, you can apply for an extension of your ESI status um, right now based on um, disruptions caused by the shutdown. So that's something you can do now. What about in review, uh, Max Sood? Uh, I, I don't think uh, th that is, you know, in the review that will be considered. I think only think that if there is uh, productivity issues and uh, because of that, maybe that is considered. But since this is in October uh, deadline, and uh, so I, I'm not sure how for the next 20, uh, 2021 um, 05. Uh, this is going to be taken into account uh, how much COVID had an effect and what kind of a consideration should be given to those kind of PIs. Uh, but that is not 
take into account for the review criteria. There are other flexibilities given due to the COVID, for example, extension of the ESA status. This round we give extension for submission of the application because of the COVID. And we, this round also gave an exception that the PIs can submit a one page research update, which is normally not allowed. But because of the COVID, we gave that flexibility. So those flexibilities are given because of the COVID, but you know, I don't think they can be just uh, incorporated in the assessing the review criteria. Okay, uh, question about the budget. So normally in the budget justification, you'd say who's in your lab to justify the budget. Um, but that that's not part of it uh, in this case. Uh, Lisa, Silaja, Maxu, do you want to comment on where, where, and when, if ever, will we ask for information about your personnel in relation to your budget? Hi, it's Hi. Lisa. So this is the unusual thing about the Mira application. Um, the only time you'll mention a personnel on the budget is you'll list the PI under personnel and you'll um, put their um, effort in person months, but you'll state zero under salary. You don't have to then list them in the budget justification. You won't be listing any other personnel either on the budget pages or in the budget justification. We do not need that to determine your funding level. Okay, I just pasted in the box the feedback loop about demographic trends uh, in the mirror program up to 28 fiscal year 2018. Um, oh, question and this again for Max Sood. So um, there's been flexibility given due to COVID-19 for other applications um, and allowing people to submit a one page research update. Is, is that going to be true for Mira as well? For this round, yes, for this round, the, it is for the mirrors all of it also, but this round, it is established investigator mirrors. The next round, which is the October 2nd deadline for the uh, ESIs, at that time, whether NI is going to consider that or not, we do not know that yet. So that will be the decision made for by the Office of External Research, OER of NIH. And if it is done, then there'll be a notification published accordingly and you will know about it. But as of now, we do it, we did it only for this round. Great. And now I actually have pasted that link in. I pasted it just in for Matt before, but here there it is now. Uh, median funding level for Mira, Silaja. What's the median funding level for ESI Miras? It's it's one two fifty thousand. <laughs> That's right. Two fifty thousand. So, <laughs> yes. Basically, all ESI Mira grantees um, get two hundred fifty thousand dollars in direct costs, which is the maximum. Um, there are a very small number who requested less for various reasons, and and often that's what they get. But Almost everyone gets 250, and that is. But that is 250 year. per year. Per year. That it yeah. costs. Good point. And you get what you request. If you request 248,000, that's all you get. You request 230, that's all. We can't give you more than you requested. Yeah. So. Folks, so. folks should also be cautious about requesting equipment because when uh, you request equipment, there's no FNA costs that come with that. So you may want to give that added consideration. Do you really want to request equipment in, in this application? Yeah, that, that's really good advice, Lisa. I would recommend generally um, don't request the equipment um, in your application. We often have equipment supplement programs, which MIRA grantees are eligible for, and you could apply for that, you know, a year or two down the road. And if you find that you do need equipment, you can always rebudget. But if you ask for it up front in your application, you're not going to get FNA that goes along with it. So you could cut yourself short. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, question about letters of collaboration. This, I guess, for, for Max Sood and, and maybe also Silage. Is it a good idea to have letters of collaboration? And how much collaboration do we see in the mirror program? I think collaborations are collaborations are allowed, but as long as the collaborators are not asking for the funds. I think if there's a collaborator on the application, they should basically use their own funds for the part of the research they are just collaborating on. It, it is okay to include uh, letters of collaboration as long as there is no, they are not budgeted. Now, if there is a consortium agreement for collaboration, 
the mm. letters must be included. Otherwise, you don't have to include them. And if you're not giving any funds to your collaborations, there's no need for letters. Yeah, and I think the, the FOA is very explicit that there is no expectation or encouragement of you to have a letter from your, say, previous mentor. Um, th that's not something you really need. And in fact, as we're kind of hoping that you'll be moving in, in new directions, um, probably not something you want, um, unless it's a letter saying that you can take the project with you, you know, completely or something like that. Interesting question here. If you need less money, can you can that make you more fundable? So say you're at a primarily undergraduate institution working mostly with undergrads. You don't need or really couldn't probably spend 250,000 a year in direct costs. Um, can you ask for less? Silage, I think that's interesting. Uh, yeah, it is interesting. You can always ask for less, but it doesn't make any difference for fundability because we are looking at the scores and the, uh, the project and all the holistic process. So um, it's not one of the, asking for less money is not the criteria we're looking to fund a grant. But ask what you need. Yeah, what yeah. You, yeah. I think that's right. important. Ask what you need. Uh, yeah, not, right. you know, don't go the maximum if you don't need it because um, and I think that could affect um, at least the decision on how much to give you. Um, and so you might as well ask for what you actually need. Right. So I, I can I add to that also yes. is that for the review purposes, the budget is a non-scorable criteria. So in, in respect of what you ask, they are not going to just uh, put that in the, uh, you know, calculate the overall impact of the score. So it is not going to jeopardize your uh, score, what you ask. If you ask for more, the reviewers can basically say that it is too much for the research proposed. It's a very impactful science. I mean, they may be enthusiastic about it, but they may recommend a reduction in the budget based on what you have proposed. But it's not going to affect your score if you ask more. They can always recommend to reduce the budget. Yeah. yeah just ask what is appropriate for the work proposed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so then there are a couple more questions about the um, letters from uh collaborators so if you're providing biospecimens and uh, someone's going to do analysis or or someone's going to tell you that they're willing to share samples um etc et max sued probably always a good idea to have you know a letter just from a collaborator saying that they are willing to collaborate with you and they support whatever you're doing is that right Yes, particularly if you are just getting a certain resources or you are getting reagents from some people, they should include the letter because if you don't have the reagent and you have a re you have a letter of somebody who is providing that, that is always good that they, then the reviewers know that you are going to have something that is needed for the research available from this person who has provided the letter. So uh, it is that is important to include um, and it helps. Um, so with the so, exception of uh, materials from foreign countries. So yeah. But but I, I think if you do not need to include a letter from somebody, do not just include just do you think that is going to make it stronger. Remember always that any letter you put in an application from a collaborator is going to automatically put that person in conflict. So if that is the best person to review that application, that person will not be able to review it because that person will be in conflict if, if that person is serving on the panel. So uh, you should always, I mean, uh, ensure that the letters are necessary for the application, not just for the sake of it, just to make it look bad, good. Lisa, question for you. Someone wants to know what F&A cost is. That's sort of NIH jargon. Yeah, F&A is what we used to call indirect cost. So you'll be requesting your direct cost and uh, you'll request your indirect cost or F&A as you normally would, I think using, um, I think it's the checklist page, they call it. That's where you request your F&A and you should request it as normal. Okay, looks like we're kind of at the end of the questions. Um, see, is it better for collaborator to run the assay for you with their funding? because you don't have the expertise currently or ready for the collaborative train your student to run the assay. Axud, what's your experience with that? I, I think either way is fine. I think if the collaborator is doing some work but using their own NIGMS funding or whatever funding they have, that's also fine. 
and if they are just providing you the opportunity to train somebody uh, who can do the work in your lab, then that's fine too. Yeah, it seems like it's kind of a question of whether that's something that you want to be doing in your lab or that it's really, you know, not in your area of expertise at all. So you're just going to be strongly collaborating with somebody. Um, if I have a joint appointment in two departments, can we have letters co-signed by two department chairs? Uh, I think that's fine, right? Yes. That should be fine. Right. Yeah. yeah, not a problem. Um, are letters directly from your mentoring committee members helpful or a distraction? Interesting, Maxud. Uh, the mentoring committee, I think. I, I think the department letter, uh, department chair's letter, should emphasize that there is a mentoring committee in place for this investigator. That should be enough. Then, in that case, they don't need to just provide individual letters for all. From all the committee members. Yeah, I think that should be in the department chair or whoever letter. That's a good point. Uh, someone has an R15 grant would like to know if they can apply for an ESI Mira based on the work proposed in the R15. Yeah, I think that's that's perfectly fine as long as you are still an early stage investigator, as Silage outlined, and uh, your work fits in the mission of NIGMS, as she also talked about. Yep. Uh, let's see. For recent progress section, does it have to be related to the proposed project? Uh, or any progress made over the last five years? I think it has to be related to the project you're proposing, unless it's, again, any exp any technology, any expertise you could use from there to the project, the program you're proposing, I think that would help. Yeah, I mean, I guess take the example of someone who's really moving into something very different than what they did as a postdoc. So the the scientific area they were working on as a postdoc and a grad student is not directly related um, but as Sila just said presumably you learned things um, as a postdoc and a graduate student that are now allowing you to do this new research and i think those are you know those are things you'd want to highlight in your your section on past work so you talk about your past work but you make clear why the, the studies you did um, and the things you learned methodology, et cetera, will allow you to move in this new direction. And we encourage that, um, you know, but you have to make the case to the reviewers you know, why you are, are able to do it. That's a good question. Uh, does the dean's letter weigh more than a chair's letter? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. This depends on how good the letter is, Maxud. Yeah, it depends on how good the letter is. I mean, what is... Uh, you, like everybody said, the, the letter has to have the institutional commitment towards the success of this individual, long-term success. So it can be from either from the dean or from the department chair. And for saying the same things, it will mean the same thing. Yeah. Uh, let's see, we're gonna have to end. We're almost at time, so I'll just take three more questions here. If we're collaborating on a different project than the proposed Mira, one with someone else, is that person a good reference writer? So, Max Sood, reference letters do do is that a good thing or not a good thing? So, what was it? What was it again? I, so, if they're collaborating with somebody on something different, should that person write them basically a reference letter for their mirror? I don't think it's necessary unless it is uh, needed to support the application in some way. There's no need to you know provide somebody that you know a person has collaborated with. I I, I don't think it's necessary. Uh, if it is not going to contribute anything to the proposal. Okay, is the research proposed a vision of the lab or the specific questions that need to be answered in the five-year period? Um, I, th I think you kind of want to show them the arc of where you're headed, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Your overall vision, they definitely are looking for that from, from the statements we see from our viewers. Uh, but, but you really want to tell them, okay, why is the the project, the things you're proposing to work on, why are those important for the field? Why are the specific questions that you're proposing to answer the important questions that need to be answered? And why are you the right person to be answering those? That's kind of the, the way we like to think about it. Yeah, that's correct. And also the long term vision, where are you going? Like uh, sometimes I have a panel not happy, the focus is very narrow, they ding on them. So just make sure that you have a short-term vision, a long-term vision, explain where you're going after this. 
Yeah. So um, rivers also rivers also look at one, I mean it, it, important thing you need to keep in mind. One is can it be done, and then the second question is should it be done. Mm -hmm. So that's very important to convey it that it should be done and it it can be done. So last two questions are preliminary data is not required, but how many applications have preliminary data? We haven't done a formal analysis of that silage of Maxu. Do you have a sense? Uh, this, is, uh, the, this is the first first time after this uh, FOA was reissued. In this reissued FOA, there is clearly stated that preliminary data is not required. Yeah. Now, in the previous FOA, that was not clearly stated. So I would think majority of the applications would include the you know, preliminary data. So, That's but true, yeah. but in this FOA is clearly stated that it is neither required nor necessary. So I'm assuming that many people may not have preliminary data, we should be okay. Yeah, that's correct, because I've seen the review panel, if you are in the first year, first year or two of your ESI position, they understand it. They're very uh, understanding, thrilling. Oh, he just joined and he's bringing a project from somewhere, that's all he has. They, they really favor that if you don't have preliminary data in the initial stages. But if you've been there for four or five years, um, maybe they expect it and consider it like whether you have anything to submit. Okay, uh, very last question since we are actually over time. Issue of overlap with early career awards. If you're submitting both and they both want broad uh, visions, how do you juggle um, making sure they're distinct? Um, Silaja, Lisa, Maxud, um, you know, I guess some of this is just you, you should make sure that, that what they're going to be funding is not overlapping and that you're not going to be citing both those grants on the same papers. But what else would you say? Yeah, um, that's very important because uh, I also want to mention if you, NHMS staff is, see, program staff is seriously look at this and submit progress reports, so overlapping grant support and citations. Um, so you have to be careful when you go to, and it's also a requirement by notice of award that NIH support should be acknowledged appropriately. Um, so uh, make sure that comes off very clear which grant support what work. Okay, I'll just very quickly answer two last ones. One was should a five-year timeline be included? Um, I think that's fine. I, I don't know that you need to since you have flexibility, but it wouldn't hurt to to sort of show that you've thought out how long things are going to take. Um, and if the proposal is broader than an R01, which it definitely should be, how do you juggle having, you know, Mira and then an R01 in the same or nearby rounds? Uh, they, they should be very different grants. Uh, we allow you to have them in the same round, um, but they will be very different to write. And so it's really up to you whether you want to do that or you want to sort of separate them um, in time and in scientific thinking. Uh, some people are successful in doing it together. Others, I think, like to separate it. Is that fair, Silaja and Maxud? Yeah. OK. Yeah. Silaja, back to you. All right. Thank you so much for all of you to listening and um, all NHMS staff for uh, being in the uh, webinar. And please, um, if you have any other questions we missed answering or we haven't answered, please send them to me. Um, I will take care of them. Thank you. So can I add one more thing? I want to thank everybody first for joining and everybody for participating and contributing. But I just want to apologize for the typo that uh, the submission deadline for this FO is, was uh, October 3. Actual deadline is October 2. Again, I want to emphasize it's October 2. And you should not wait until October 2 to submit. Maybe submit a couple of days before to give yourself a chance to look at the submitted application, how the image was assembled. And I think uh, these slides, as Elijah said, will be posted. So that correction will be made there. So there is no confusion. And uh, I think it is recorded also for probably archives and if anybody wants to see it at a later date. So let's okay. pretend the submission date is September 30, 30th. How about that? Yes. Or, yeah. <laughs> Everyone on this call, your submission due date is September 30th. Yeah. Okay. Please Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks you. to Sila, Jim, Maxud, and Lisa, and Judith for participating. And all of you, we strongly encourage you to apply to this program. Yeah. Thanks bye -bye. for moderating. Thank you so much. <laughs>